presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Greer Garson and Walter Pidgeon in Blossoms in the Dust with Felix Presshart. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Every city and town in America has its unsung heroes and heroines, men and women who have devoted their lives to an ideal. They've worked without hope of wealth, without thought of glory. Their only reward, the satisfaction of a job worth doing and well done. Such a woman is the heroine of Blossoms in the Dust. Her ideal is a better world for the homeless children of today and tomorrow. And if you imagine that finding homes for babies is not a thrilling subject for a motion picture or radio play, believe me, you're wrong. Because the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture stirred the hearts of audiences all over the country. Both the picture and Greer Garson's performance in it have been nominated for Academy Awards this year. And incidentally, the two stars who played Blossoms in the Dust on the screen Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon, are currently making another picture together, Mrs. Minifer. So we borrowed them from the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer sound stages for this drama of one woman's fight for other women's children. And remember as you listen that this is the story of a real woman who is living and working today. The first duty of any theater is to please its public. And that's just as true of this national theater that Lux Flakes has made possible as it was true of the theater in China 40 centuries ago, the theater in Greece 25 centuries ago, or the theater of Shakespeare a little more than three centuries ago. As a matter of fact, if the audience doesn't like the play, the actors are wasting their time. And this first axiom of the theater applies to any other business, like making soap flakes, for instance. If Lux Flakes hadn't stood for quality, you wouldn't have applauded them all these years. Now the first act of Blossoms in the Dust, starring Greer Garson as Edna and Walter Pigeon as Sam, with Felix Bressart as Dr. Bresler. <laughs> the Cayley House in Green Bay, Wisconsin, is aglow with the lights of a hundred lanterns. The year is 1895, and the occasion is the engagement party of the two Cayley girls, Edna and Charlotte. There's to be a double wedding soon, which makes the evening doubly exciting. Upstairs in their room, amid a clutter of hat boxes, ribbons, and paper wrappings, the girls are dressing feverishly. Hilda, the maid, is trying desperately to fix Charlotte's hair. You'll have to sit still, Miss Charlotte. Yes, Hilda. Edna, are you ready? I will be. Charlotte, tell me something. Do I look like a hussy? Edna, what on earth do you mean? What do I? Do I look like the sort of girl men insult? Because I've been insulted. Why, Edna Cayley, when? Well, this afternoon, I went to the bank to cash a check. And the cashier, my dear, the cashier of that bank... Well, what on earth did he do? He, he, he looked at me. Oh, oh, but you can't blame him for a thing like that. He looked at me and, and smiled. And then I took off my gloves and he saw my ring, Damon's ring. Now, what do you think he had the effrontery to say? He said, if that's an engagement ring, young lady, you'd better get rid of it right quick. Oh, no. Right quick. Huh. Must be a Westerner. I was never so outraged in my life. Well, what on earth did you say? Well, I don't know what possessed me, but I asked him why. And he said, oh, well, <laughs> what did he say, darling? He said, because you're going to marry me. He didn't. Oh, how perfectly thrilling. Thrilling? I was absolutely furious. Oh, what did you do? Did you slap him or anything? No, I just picked up the money and walked straight out of the bank. But I'm going to tell Father. I'm going to see that that impudent cashier is discharged tomorrow. Was he good looking? Oh, wasn't anywhere near as handsome as Damon. Miss Edna, are you ready for your dress? Yes, Hilda. Well, stand up then. Here's your new bustle. Ain't it a daisy? Oh, it's lovely. I think we're both awfully lucky, Edna. Just think. In two weeks, we'll be married. Mrs. Damon McPherson and Mrs. Allen Keith. Oh, I can't believe it somehow if it weren't for my ring. 
Oh, Edna, I'm so terribly happy and so terribly grateful. Grateful? Why, Charlotte? For all your darling parents have done for me. Oh, Charlotte, dear, you mustn't. I was such a baby when I came here to live. I don't even remember my own mother and father. But you've let me share yours. And I love you for it. I always will. But think how happy you've made us. And we'll never be separated, really. We'll be brides together, young wives together, and maybe someday we'll be mothers, too. Edna! How can you mentioning such a thing? Why not? I don't know about you, but I'm going to have five sons and five daughters. Edna! Listen, the carriage. Oh, it's Dame and Ellen. Hurry, darling, hurry. <laughs> Where in heaven's name are the girls? Here's Miss Edna, Mrs. Cayley. Edna. Oh, hello, Mother. Edna, dear, Dame has been frantic. Go and dance with him. Hurry. <laughs> Edna, where have you been all this time? Hello, Damon. Oh, darling, you, you look wonderful. I feel wonderful. Oh, you know something, sweetheart? I'm the happiest man in the world. Thank you, Damon. I hope we'll always be... Oh. Oh. Uh. What is it, dear? Nothing. I... Oh, oh, Damon, be an angel and get me a handkerchief from Hilda. Why, of course, darling. Don't go away now. Edna, Edna, have you seen Alan? Charlotte, he's here. Well, of course he is. No, 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 I don't mean Alan. I mean that man. The one who insulted me. Where? That's him over there talking to Father. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. Edna, wait! You're an honest young man, I'll say that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cayley. Well, Father, may I speak to you? Of course, dear. Well, Mr. Gladney, you've already met my daughter. Oh, good evening. Good evening. Father, I want to tell you about this young man's keen attention to business when I was at the bank this afternoon. You can't tell me anything about Sam Gladney, my dear. The Wisconsin County Bank is backing him in a new business venture. What? Oh, but... Thanks I... for the testimonial, sir. Miss Cayley, uh, when I cashed you a check this afternoon, I shortchanged you. Is that so? He's come all the way out here to make restitution, my dear. Oh, no bother, sir. No bother at all. Here you are, Miss Cayley. Ten cents. Thank you very much. You may keep it as a tip for your honesty. Thank you very much, but uh, I'd rather have this dance. Oh, I'm so sorry. You see, it belongs to my fiancé. Oh, Damon's not around. Go on, dance with Mr. Gladney. You danced beautifully, Miss Edna. How would you know, Mr. Gladney? Oh, uh, sorry. Did I step on your foot? Oh, just lightly, Mr. Gladney. By the way, you didn't shortchange me this afternoon. I can't do the change because I didn't trust you. You're doggone right, Miss Edna. And I suppose I should have taken a little more time to get acquainted. But, you see, I'm leaving tomorrow to go back to Texas in the flower business. How interesting. Your father's asked me out here a couple of times to meet the family. Uh, I didn't accept well because I've been up to my neck in this new flour mill of mine. I wish I'd have known that you were here. Don't tell me that I'd rival the flower business. Well, <laughs> you'd have come darn near it. Thank you. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry, Miss Edna. Is, the, is this the way they dance in Texas? Shucks, yes. Why, in Texas we dance to have fun, don't you? Uh, I believe I've had enough of dancing. All right, Miss Edna, you're the boss. But I'm not quite through talking, though. I don't think you're the kind of a girl who'd play a mean trick on any man by marrying him when you belong by rights to someone else. You're, you're in stuff. No, 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 wait a minute. When you showed up at my window this afternoon, my mind was miles away from, well, from girls or anything like them. But when you shoved that check at me, something fairly shouted in my ear and said, Sam, that's the future Mrs. Gladney. Didn't you hear it? Oh, I didn't like to be fresh, but I had to act quick. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going back to Texas and fix it all up for you. Polish off the sun, sweep up the prairies and spread out the welcome mat along the old Red River. Then next spring, I'm coming back to fetch you. You want to know what time my train leaves? No, it's, it's of no interest to me whatsoever. It leaves at 10.58 in the morning. And if you'd like to come down to see me off, I'll be looking for you. I shouldn't be here, Charlotte. Oh, there he is on the observation car. Wave to him, Edna. Oh, no, no, I, I... Hello, thanks for coming. Wave, Edna, wave. Goodbye, Miss Edna. Good, good, goodbye. Write to me. I'll wire 
you tomorrow. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Edna, it's thrilling. Love at first sight. When is he coming back? He said, he said in the spring. Oh, Charlotte. Oh, Charlotte, what am I going to tell Damon? Mrs. Cayley? Charlotte! It's Sam. He's back. You know I'm a little flustered. The second time we meet, and I soon have to call you Sam. <laughs> well, that's all right with me, Mother. <laughs> Hello, Sam. Hello, Charlotte. I think you rate a kiss, too, for getting Edna to the station that morning. Oh, I knew it was all up with poor Damon the moment I saw you. Poor Damon. He's been happily married for three whole months. Sit there, Charlotte. In the library, going over some mysterious matter with my future in-laws. Oh, Mr. Gladney... What stand do you take on the subject of double weddings? Double what? Charlotte and Edna were graduated together. They came out together and so... Oh, and now they want to be hitched in double tandem, eh? Well, why not? Having a fellow victim might buck a man up. Eh? <laughs> I haven't asked Alan folks about it yet. I'm going in and broach the subject now. Are you afraid? Who, me? I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> you come along with me, dear. I'll stand by you. Thank you. There'll be no argument, Charlotte. We'll just tell them, dear. <laughs> All right. Well, here we are. But, Mother, I don't care. It doesn't mean a thing. Nothing can come between me and Charlotte ever. Listen, that... That was Alan. I still say a marriage of this kind is impossible. Why, it's unthinkable. What are they saying? Alan! Oh, Charlotte, don't come in, please. But what is it, Alan? Father, what is it? There's something we've got to straighten out, Charlotte. You run along now. George! It's about time that child was told a little truth. Oh, Sarah, oh, please. Oh, Mother, don't. What is it, Mrs. Keats? I want to know. Something has come out that interferes with your plans to marry my son. But what is it? I haven't done anything wrong. Oh, it isn't true, Alan. Whatever they say, it isn't true. I wish you were right, Charlotte. But it's come to our knowledge that you are a foundling, a nameless foundling, with an unknown father. Sarah, how could you? I... I didn't know that I was nameless, Mrs. Keith. Of course you didn't, but you knew it, George. You too, Catherine. And my own son tried to hide it. Except for the kindness of a woman who keeps the files in the license bureau, it might never have come to light. But whose business is it anyway but mine? It's everybody's business now. It's common gossip. She's the only one I'll ever marry, Mother. You can make up your mind to that. Well, this doesn't mean a thing, Charlotte. Not a thing. We'll go away. We'll go someplace where nobody knows us. Yes, away from his work and his family. Sarah. Why, it'll wreck his no, life. Mother, stop. Run along, Charlotte, darling. I have a plan to talk over with Alan. Yes, and don't worry, dear. We love each other, and that's all that really matters. Everything's going to be fine. I think I know now how things are going to be, Alan. I'll be up in my room if you want me. Charlotte! Charlotte, where are you going? To my room. What, did Mrs. Keats agree, dear? Did we get the double wedding? Charlotte, answer me! Charlotte, what's the matter? Sam, something's wrong. Did you see her face? You better go speak to her, darling. Well, she she wouldn't answer me. Oh, they've said something. They... Ah! Sam! Edna, what was that? I don't know. Oh, oh Mr. Cayley! Mr. Cayley! Hilda, what's happened? Miss Charlotte, she killed herself. <laughs> Dear Mother, after almost three years in Texas, I love it more than ever. Our new house will be a wonderful place to bring up a child, or as Sam says, to bring up our son. He is very certain it will be a boy. Down at the mill, they tell me he talks of nothing else. Buying wheat forever, Sam. Not all by yourself. How about amalgamating? Sharing profits as well as losses. You may be right, Charlie. But do you see that sign out there over the mill? Samuel Gladney owner? Someday that sign will read, Samuel Gladney and son. I can't take in partners without consulting him. That son of yours may turn out to be your daughter. <laughs> Impossible. 
I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Gladney, but your butler says it's imperative that you go right home. What for? Mr. Sam, sir. What's the matter, Zeke? Uh, Mr. Sam, you've got to get right home to your wife. What? But, but, but it isn't time yet. Babies ain't got calendars. <laughs> Holy smoke. Have you called the doctor? That's just the trouble, boss. We can't find it. You can't what? Dr. West done went on a fishing trip and fishers ain't got telephones. My sister's got a wonderful doctor, Mr. Gladys. Well, call him up then. Yes, sir. Come on, Zeke. His name is Dr. Breast. I don't care what his name is. Call him. Sorry, gentlemen. Come on, Zeke. Get on. Edna, can I, uh, can I come in? No, Sam. Yes, of course you can come in. Listen, are you, uh, uh, are you ready for a visitor, darling? Because if you are, I want to introduce you to my son. Son? Oh, Sam. It's come true, hasn't it? Uh, nurse, now, will you just uh, bring him over here? Be careful now. Would you like him there beside you, Mrs. Gladney? That's one of the things I disapprove of most. Oh, uh, darling, this is Dr. Bressler. Yes, I know. Ah, the time is coming when newborn babies will be kept in glass cages away from their parents. Nurse, take the baby back to the nursery, please. Yes, Dr. Bressler. I'm sorry, Mrs. Gladney. Doctor's orders, you know. Sam, tell me. Is he very beautiful? Darling, he's just what I ordered. Red hair and all. Oh, little Sammy. Yep, our boy. Uh, that's enough for now. Outside, Mr. Gladney. All right. Bye, dear. Come along, please. Uh, Dr. Bressler, mm -hmm. she's all right, isn't she? Mm -hmm. Your regular physician is here. He'll tell you himself. Well, Sam, you've got a fine son. Congratulations. Oh, thanks, Dr. West. I've been over the case with Dr. Bressler. Sorry I couldn't get here in time. Oh, uh, Dr. Bressler, have you explained to Mr. Gladney the findings relative to the pelvimetry? Uh, uh, what's that mean? Uh, he is trying to say that motherhood in a case like your wife's is extremely dangerous. Oh, I didn't know that. Edna won't be able to have another child, Sam. Thank heaven she's safe. Uh, are you sure she is safe? No, absolutely. Why, Bressler's handled the case as well as I could have done myself. Thanks. Maybe I ought to start charging as much as you do. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. I hope we have occasion to meet sometime uh, uh, socially. Uh, I'm a busy man, Mr. Gladney. I don't even have time to go fishing. <laughs> Christmas. Why, another present for young Sam. Let me see, Mommy. Let me see. Now, young fella, you just settle down there a little. Where's a Merry Christmas present, Mommy? Here it is. Well, <laughs> another music box. <laughs> <laughs> that makes four, doesn't it? I like this one, Mommy. Well, Mrs. Gladney. Yes, nurse. It's uh, almost three o'clock, Mrs. Gladney. Oh, good heavens. Well, Sammy, let's get these toys cleared away, huh? No, no, I want to play. Doesn't somebody want to take a nice ride in the pony cart and get some air? No. Now, look, Sammy, you wouldn't want the doctor to scold Mummy because you missed your airing. No. That's the boy. Now, run along with Nurse. We'll take Mr. Teddy Bear with us. And the engine, and the soldiers, and the Christmas tree. Oh, Sammy, you can't. Don't you think it might be too much of a load for the poor little pony? No, we can only take one toy, Sammy. Well, which one's it going to be there, partner? The teddy bear. <laughs> That's loyalty for you. The oldest toy of the button. Oh, you darling. Now, goodbye, Sammy. Come Come watch, on, watch me drive off, Mommy and Daddy. All right, darling, we'll watch from the window. Hurry up there. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Say, <laughs> looks like a cyclone hit this place. Huh? I've got to tidy up. You've been pretty extravagant this Christmas, Mr. Gladney. Why not? Wheat's still going up. Did it go up as much as that diamond pin you gave me? More. That pin cost a few thousand bushels, and, well, I still have a little left. Not counting what you've got in your pocket. Ah, don't be silly. I don't carry wheat in my pocket anymore. What do you want to bet? Just let me see. <laughs> no, no. Come on. No, no, Edna, now stop it. Get out of it. Get your hat on. No, hold still there. Now, what's this? Half a handful of wheat. <laughs> oh, I'll never be civilized, darling. I don't know how you stand me. Oh, you don't take such an awful lot of standing. That's what I was fishing for. Come on. Kiss me. No. <laughs> Are you happy, Edna? Terribly happy. There's one little single thing I'd change, except to have Charlotte. Well, Charlotte and Sammy would have loved each other. She was so gay and so full of fun. Mr. Gladner! Mr. Gladner! Why, what's the matter? Mr. Gladner, sir! Zeke, is there anything wrong? Sam is, sir, young Sam. What's happened? Where is he? You stay here, Miss Gladner. Don't go out. What is it? You wait here, darling. 
Oh, Mrs. Glenn. Please tell me what happened. An accident, ma'am. The pony cart, it done turned over, ma'am. Was Fanny hurt? Oh, Mrs. Glenn. Did you hear me? Was he hurt? They's bringing him in. They's carrying him in. Oh, no. No. Sam, no. let me see him. He hurt badly. Come down here. You see him. Edna, listen. Sam, his face. He's so... Sammy. Sammy, it's Mummy. It's Mummy, darling. I'm right here, darling. Speak to me, Sammy. Edna. Speak to me. Please get the doctor to come at once. Edna, it's... It's no use, darling. Don't you... Can't you see, dear? No. No, how could that be? He was here. Just a little while ago. I held him in my arms. I kissed him. My baby. My baby. My baby. <laughs> In just a moment, Mr. DeMille will bring us Act Two of Blossoms in the Dust, starring Pierre Garson and Walter Pigeon with Felix Bessart. Morning, noon, night. The dishes have to be done. My goodness, you don't have to tell me. Just look at my poor hands. What's that you're sprinkling into the dishpan? Why, uh, the soap I always use. May I see it? Oh. You know, this is what's making your hands red and rough. Not the dishwashing you do. Look, will you make an experiment for me? Why, if it's really easy. Take this box of new Quick Lux and use it for your dishes every day for a week instead of that harsh soap you've been using. Will you do that? I'd be glad to. Well, that was a week going by. And now here we are again. Only a week and my hands are better already. I can hardly believe that just changing to Lux Flakes for dishes can make such a difference in my hand. But it can. This has been proved in scores of laboratory tests of Lux and five other well-known dishwashing soaps. Tests made under conditions similar to home dishwashing. In these tests, not only did dishpan hands improve in from two to seven days after changing to new quick Lux, but at the end of the test, the hands were once again soft and smooth and lovely without the use of creams or lotions. Just changing to Lux made the difference. Now, if you have let harsh wash day soaps in your dishpan redden and roughen your hands, change to Lux Flakes for your dishes tomorrow. See how quickly your hands lose that unattractive dishpan look and how quickly, thoroughly, and thriftily those speedy flakes do your dishes. One big box of new Quick Lux does dishes for about 45 meals. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Act two of Blossoms in the Dust. Starring Greer Garson as Edna and Walter Pigeon as Sam, with Felix Bressart as Dr. Bresler. With the death of her child, Edna tried valiantly to build a new existence. In desperation, she threw herself into the social life of the town, and the home that had seemed so empty was filled with the laughter of guests. She's entertaining again this evening. But in the library are two guests who have come uninvited. Dr. Bresler and a little child of three. Good evening, Dr. Bresler. Ah, your husband once invited me to come here socially, Mrs. Gladney. Looks as if I'd picked out a fairly social evening. Well, I'm glad to see you, Doctor, always. And uh, who is this? She's a pretty little thing, whoever she is. Hello there, little girl. Hello. He's in transit to the county orphanage. Seeing you're the only folks I know with more beds than you sleep in, I'd like to leave her here for tonight. I see. Sam, haven't you and Dr. Bressler chosen rather a bad moment for your conspiracy? I happen to be entertaining Baron Emden. Perhaps some other time might have been better, Doctor. The child's mother had to be sent to the hospital tonight. There's no need to take her to the orphanage. You can board it out until the mother's well. Sam, give Dr. Bressler a check. The mother can't keep the child. She has to work. If I had a child, I'd keep it in spite of... In spite of what? Parties, balls, swirries, dressmakers, and all that boop de doodle This child's mother's a mill hand. Get that child out of here. Edna. Uh, I never thought it would work. Why should she adopt a baby? She's too busy adopting barons. Come on, child. Good night, Mrs. Gladney. This is criticism, isn't it? Criticism? Of me, of the way I choose to spend my life. 
You're trying to mend a broken heart, Edna, by hitting it with a hammer. Do I ever bore you with my broken heart? Or anyone else, do I ever mention it? It might be better, dear, if you did. All right. From the time I first realized that we were never to have children, the day hasn't gone by, or the night, that I haven't felt humiliated, useless, that deep down inside of me I'm not bitterly frustrated. You think I don't know that, Edna? Then why do you send another woman's child here to hurt me like this? You're hurting yourself, darling. Oh, Sam. Oh, Sam. That's the girl. You cry away, sweetheart. Just cry all you like. I look good, Sam. Somebody else would be better for you. I look good at all. Look hey, good. there, watch yourself. You're, you're speaking about the girl I love. Dear Mother, Sam was right, as always. The day nursery is a wonderful idea. We have 19 children now and they're darlings, all of them. I keep them during the day and their mothers keep them at night. Sometimes I hate to see evening come. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Gladney. Good morning, Miss Ross. Is Mr. Gladney in his office? Yes, ma'am. Just go right in. I tell you, Sam, you can't do it. Hello. Oh, come in, dear. Good morning, Mr. Jones. Morning. Sam, I hate to interrupt business, but I've just had such a brilliant idea. That's so? Sit down, dear. Sam, you know the vacant lot next to the nursery? Uh-huh. Well, I've just heard that they're willing to sell for a song. We could buy it and tear down the fence and enlarge the play yard. We're getting awfully crowded, you know. Uh, it's a great idea, honey, but... I'm afraid it'll have to wait for a while. Why, darling? Oh, is something wrong? Oh, I've had a little setback. But what is it, Sam? Tell me. Possibly it's going to be a great new chant. I made a lot of mistakes when I built this mill. Next time I'll do the job right. Sam, you, you've you lost the mill. Oh, I'll build another one. Oh, sweetheart, why didn't you tell me? You're tired, Sam. Oh, honey, you look ill. He is nil, Mrs. Gladney. He's insane thinking he can pay off this lot of debts he swamped with. Oh, well, maybe you can get him to go into bankruptcy. Nobody else can. There'll be uh, changes, dear. We'll have to sell the house, of course. Oh, of course. And I, uh, I have a chance for a job in the Fort Worth Mill. I'll only be the foreman, but, <laughs> well, anyway, it's a job. Sit down and eat your lunch. Thanks, dear. Wait till I take a look at this wheat. Well, I cooked the lunch myself. It's chicken pie. Sam, will you please stop staring into that microscope and pay a little attention to me? Darling, this new chaff is giving me exactly the elements I need. They told me this morning they'd take the process on here at the mill if it works out. Look, I've got the patent paper. The Gladney Wheat Wasted Process. See? We may get enough out of this to pay off every debt we left in Sherman. Sam, have I really a say in this corporation? Look at the papers, darling. S and E Gladney, proprietor. Then stop and eat your lunch. All right, as soon as I run over to the courthouse with these papers. Let me. I'm a partner. Okay, partner, run along. And they were tagged, Sam. Tagged like cattle. Uh, Edna, what is all this? Where did you see these children? But I'm telling you, darling, this afternoon when I went to the courthouse for you, I happened to pass by this big room, and there were all these orphan children. They had tags on them. Oh, Sam, it was horrible. Well, uh, what happened? Well, there was one there. He was only three months old. His name was Tony, and this woman was going to adopt him. Uh -huh. And then she changed her mind. You see, they, they didn't know who the child's father was. But, oh, Sam, he's such a sweet little thing, and... Uh, oh, wait a minute, uh, Edna... Where is the child now? Well, that's what I wanted to tell you. He's upstairs in the bedroom. <laughs> May I uh, see him, Edna? Oh, Sam, I knew you'd understand. Uh, and you love the little girl, too. What little girl? Well, well, you see, there were two of them, and I... Oh, come on upstairs, Sam. You mean you've adopted two children? No, not really adopted them. You see, they were both fatherless, and nobody would take them. So the judge let me have them. He's giving me two weeks to find homes for them. And Sam, I'm going to do it. Yeah, I think you are. Careful now, dear. They're asleep. Go in, Sam. See? Here's a little girl. And, and this, this is 
Tony, Sam. Why, he, he's got red hair, hasn't he? Yes. Isn't he beautiful? Tony. Uh, hello, Tony. Shh, don't wake them, darling. I won't look. He's smiling. You're, you're not angry, are you, Sam? You think I did right? Of course. But I know you, darling. This is only two. You'll probably wind up with 40. <laughs> Him, I get him sun. Mm, that's what he needs, especially massage. There's a new method of massage underwater, but it takes an expert operator. Couldn't I learn? Uh, probably. He's such a darling. You have to look at him. If we could only make him well, well enough to put into a real home somewhere. Mrs. Gladney, may I speak to you? Oh, of course. A doctor. I'm all finished here. Yeah? Oh, then will you step outside, Mrs. Gilworth? Mrs. Gladney, when I came here, out of the goodness of my heart, I didn't expect to be insulted. Oh, I am sorry, but Dr. Bressler has come all the way from Sherman. He's a very busy pediatrician. Pediat... She means a baby doctor. Yes, I know. Yes. Uh... Well, I'm, I'm adopting a baby. Uh, maybe you'd like to help with your advice, doctor. Oh. I'd want to know all about the baby, of course. Its background, parents, and uh, so on. Oh, yes, indeed. We have to be very careful about the children. And the prospective parents. Uh, naturally. What's that? Uh, now, here's our questionnaire. Would you mind answering a few routine questions? Uh, well, uh... Uh, I'll help you, Edna. What's your name, please? Gilworth. Mrs. Marcus Gilworth. Husband's occupation. He's a member of the Board of Supervisors. Two names of people who will vouch for you. I said my husband is a member of the board. Character witness, none. But I didn't say that... He didn't... How old are you? Uh, well, well, why, I... I well, well, how old? I, I'm 35. 40, oh, all right. How dare you! You're getting off easy, madam. I'll take over now, doctor. Uh, let me see. Any TB in the family, Mrs. Gilbert? No. Insanity? Certainly not. Hereditary diseases? That's enough. I'm leaving. But you haven't heard the last of this. The Board of Supervisors will take up your case, Mrs. Gladney. Mrs. Gladney, you are aware of the zoning laws in your district? Yes, I am. Then surely you must know that those laws prohibit the running of an institution such as yours in that district? I told you I'd find another place for the children. Fort Worth has an adequate poor farm and city orphanage, Mrs. Gladney. But don't you see, gentlemen, I'm equipped to get children into homes. Real homes to interest people in adopting babies who might never have thought of it. You have a peculiar way of interesting them, madam. Gentlemen, my wife went to Mrs. Gladney's place to inquire about adopting a baby and was grossly insulted. My name is Gilworth, Mrs. Gladney. I know. Your wife was asked to answer a set of routine questions, Mr. Gilworth, for the good of the child she hoped to adopt. This city has had very few complaints, Mrs. Gladney, over our treatment of orphans. Oh, I wish you'd stop calling them orphans. And what do you call them, Mrs. Gladney? They're children. 
our children. Every child born into this world belongs to the whole human race. Don't you think that's a few too many for your budget, Mrs. Gladney? I move we put this to a vote. I second the motion. Those in favor of granting Mrs. Gladney's request to carry on her work signify in the usual manner. Aye. Aye. Those against? No. no. I'm sorry, Mrs. Gladney. If you're able to, later to carry on to show adequate funds and a proper building to house the children, we'll be glad to reopen the matter. Thank you. Yeah, Edna. Oh, Max, dear, it's sweet of you to come for me, but I'm I think you'd better run on home uh, right away, Edna. Home? Uh, it's Sam. They brought him home from the office. He's had a bad attack, Edna. Oh, Max. Can I go in now, Max? Just, just a moment. I'll see if he's asleep. Wait here. Sam. Yes? Edna Speck, Sam. Oh. How did it come out? Her inquisition? Oh, forget about that. You've got to quiet down now. She's got to go on, Max. She'll need her babies now as much as they need her. Shh. You'll be all right, Sam. After a little rest. <laughs> Good old Max. But you see, I know Max. You can't fool me. I'm not going back to Shaman, Sam. I'm going to stay here and help Edna. Oh, thank you, Max. You know, when they took her baby, I used to ask, why did God do this to her? I know now. Thousands of other babies needed their chance to be loved. Maybe you better send her in now, Max. Come in, Edna. Oh, Sam. Silly thing to do, fold up like this. Edna, uh, go look in my pocket, honey. Yes, dear. <laughs> Remember when I used to carry wheat, huh? I don't anymore. There's... There's this paper. Yeah. Look at it, Edna. The company has bought out the badly process. You'll soon be in the clear, darling. You... You must rest now, my darling. Tell me. What do they want you to do about the babies? It doesn't matter, sweetheart. I'm through with all that now. Oh, no, no, darling. Don't let them beat you. You're never going to desert, Edna. Never. Shh, please, dears. Listen to me, darling. You'll win. Fight for those kitties of yours. Fight for them, Edna. You'll win, Edna. Hold me close, Ed. Edna. Sam. Sam. Oh, Sam, don't leave me. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Blossoms in the Dust, starring Greer Garson and Walter Pidgeon with, with Felix Pressart in just a moment. Meantime, Sally tells me that she's been going into reverse this past week. Well, you see, I found I had two or three sweaters that were perfectly good, but just, well, not quite up to date. So I've unraveled them, and I'm going to make some new ones out of that same yarn. A neat trick, now that woolens are so precious, Sally. You know, if that yarn is still good enough to re-knit... I'll make you a little bet about those sweaters. I'll bet you took care of them. With new quick lux, of course, Mr. Sherlock Ruick. But I'm surprised at you betting on a sure thing like that. Why, I'd bet on new quick lux any day, Sally. With lux, there's no harmful alkali, no cake soap rubbing to mat and shrink woolen fibers. So, with gentle lux care, your washable woolen stays soft and unshrunken. 
will wear better. And that's important these days. Here's a trick about re-knitting yarn. As you unravel the sweater, wind the wool not into a ball, but around a piece of cardboard so that it makes a kind of stain. Tie it with string at both ends and then slip the cardboard out and lux the wool. The yarn comes out fresh and soft and easy to work with. That's a good tip, Sally. Yes, you're thrifty two ways. First, because you've made something smart and new that's cost you only a little time and effort. And second, because with Lux, you keep your pretty sweater lovely at such a tiny cost. Right. A little Lux goes a long, long way. That generous big box of Lux Flakes will do 29 sweaters. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. The curtain rises on the third act of Blossoms in the Dust, starring Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon with Felix Pressart. Three years have passed, and Edna Gladney has never stopped fighting for her children. She's won the right to continue her work with the Texas Children's Home and Aid Society. Outside in the spacious play yard, the children scamper joyfully. But one remains indoors, little Tony, Edna's favorite. Tony can't run with his playmates because his leg is supported by a steel brace. Tony, dear, you should be outside with the others. We you there, dear Edna? I want to be with you. I know, dearest. But there's lots of other little boys and girls Auntie Edna has to arrange things for. Now, you wouldn't want her to neglect them, would you? Yeah. Oh, ha, ha, no, you wouldn't. Well, Miss Planet, there's a young lady here to see you. Oh, send her in, Phil. Now, Tony, you run out in the sunshine, sweetheart. We'll be together this evening, the whole evening long. All right. Bye, Auntie Edna. Bye, sweetheart. But this way, please. Oh, come in. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. Mrs. Gladney, I have some money I haven't any use for. I'd like to give it to you for the children. Will you take it, please? Why, thank you. Oh, this looks like quite a sum. I guess it's around $700. Why are you giving me this, my dear? Well, uh, I was adopted from an institution myself. Oh? Where are your adopted parents? This is May, isn't it? That's the season on the Riviera. I suppose my mother'd be there. My father's in New York. I wanted to give you the money because you put children in the sort of homes where they belong. Goodbye, Mrs. Gladney. Just a moment. Can you tell me what's troubling you? I'm afraid I can't, Mrs. Gladney. Have you a child? No. Are you going to have one? No. <laughs> Never. There now, there now. You mustn't cry. <laughs> Sit down, dear. Won't you try and tell me about it? Or well, maybe there's something I could do to help. I, I, I'm engaged to be married. We've made such plans, David and I. We were to have a home. A real home. His people felt it best to break us up. But there was nothing they could say or do until now. Go on, go on. Dear. I found out just now that I have no right to a, a name. To any name. I found it in the record of my birth. The record I'd have to show when we went for our marriage license. Would he care? This, this David of yours? He loves me just as much as I love him. That's why I'm not going to let him go through with it. I'm not going to see him again, Mrs. Glandy, not ever. Just a moment, my dear. Please, tell Dr. Bressler I want him right away. Will you let me have your purse, please? No. Let me have what you have in it. There isn't anything. Please. Thank you. Oh, don't look, don't. What's in this bottle? Poison, isn't it? <laughs> Max, throw this, throw this away, will you? Mm, it's a good thing she didn't use it. Max, for years I've been haunted by something, something that once came very close to me. The injustice of branding innocent little nameless children in records where everyone can see, on birth certificates, of branding them all through their lives, on marriage licenses, passports, legal papers, it's cruel. It's inhumanly cruel. It's got to be stopped. But how, Edna? I don't know. There must be people I can see and speak to and make them understand. Max, I thought that taking little nameless babies, loving them and finding homes for them was all that could be done. But that's not all. Every human being that's born into this world deserves the right to make its own good name without bigotry and prejudice. Mrs. Gladney, listen. If you're as fine as I think you are, you're not going to cheat the man you love. 
You're going to marry him right now and fight for his happiness and your own. Here's your money for a trousseau. Will you take half? Oh, you bet I will. We need a dozen new creds. <laughs> Gentlemen, you have heard it said that those who transgress must be punished. Let me just say this. If you don't know what it means to a mother who loves her child to give it up to strangers, knowing that she'll never see it again, never hold it in her arms, never hear it call her mother, come to my home in Fort Worth sometime and see I'll show you punishment that will haunt you all the days of your life. People still argue about environment versus heredity. But I have put hundreds of nameless babies into respectable homes. Fine homes. And all of them, without one single exception, are growing up to be morally fit and strong. I never knew a child to take a wrong step that couldn't be traced to the ones that are bringing it up. To misunderstanding, lack of honesty, lack of sympathy, lack of heart. Oh, believe me, gentlemen, life can be made so much more beautiful by sympathy, by love and understanding than it ever can be by intolerance. I've seen hearts broken. I've seen a pure and innocent young life destroyed by this, this man-made law. For it is man-made. God has placed no dishonor on these innocent and helpless victims. Why must we, by branding these children as nameless, deprive them of their God-given right to live in happiness? kind of wonderful job, Edna. You should be proud. No, Max. The credit isn't mine. It's hers. It's Charlotte. All right. Have it your own way. But it's a law now, and no child in Texas will ever again be branded for life. Well, one ordeal's over. The next is already in waiting. What is it, Max? Edna, little Tony is almost well now. I think we can remove the brace in a few more days. Oh, Max. Yeah? Oh, I couldn't think of a better Christmas present. I know what it means to you. I know also what little Tony means to you, personally. Why, oh, what do you mean, Max? Edna, there's a man I want you to meet. His name is Eldridge. Where is he? In my office. Come along, Edna. Oh, Mr. Eldridge, I'm getting strong. <laughs> I should say you are. Oh, hello, Doctor. Ah, uh, Mr. Eldridge, this is Mrs. Gladney. How do you do, Mrs. Gladney? How do you do? We have seven puppy dogs, Auntie Edna, and he can play football, and he is a real sailboat. Your little ward and I find we have a lot in common, Mrs. Gladney. Have you? Tony, what are you doing down here at this hour? Well, I came down to hang up my stocking. Well, go on back to your room at once. Yes, Auntie Edna. Goodbye, Mr. Elsie. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I suppose Dr. Bressler has told you, Mrs. Gladney, that, that my wife and I recently lost our little boy. I know. I'm sorry. Later hasn't been well since it happened. There seems to be a question that she may not be well again. I mean, ever, Mrs. Gladney. I see. This Christmas time is very hard on her. The doctors feel that if they could put another child into her arm, a child that we could keep, it might make all the difference. Dr. Bressler told me about little Tony. I can't let you have Tony. It's a question of her reason, Mrs. Gladney, of her life. I'm sorry. The boy belongs elsewhere. I'll see that the home does the best it can for you, and as soon as possible. Thank you, Mrs. Gladney. I, I'll leave you my address. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dr. Bressler. A thousand thanks to you, just the same. Goodbye, Mr. Eldridge. Edna, this isn't the first sacrifice you have ever been asked to make, and it won't be the last. But you must think of the boy now, of Tony. If it hadn't been for me, Tony would have died. I gave him his life. He loves me. He belongs to me. Yes, Edna, you gave him his life, his body. But he needs more than that now. He needs a home, a normal home. 
He needs a mother that belongs to him. And a father, too. This isn't a home, Edna. It's an institution. I can leave here, can't I? What? Leave here? Why not? Give up the home? Desert? I've devoted years of my life to the home. I found parents for thousands of children. Thousands. I want a child for myself. This means dissolution of the home, Edna. I've done enough for the home. Time I started thinking about Edna Gladney. No, oh, that isn't Edna Gladney. Oh, you don't understand, Max. What are your plans? I'm going back to Wisconsin to make a home for my child. Edna, the day that Sam was taken from us, he said something to me I've never told you. He said he thought God took your baby from you so that thousands of homeless babies might have their chance to be loved. You don't understand. Well, maybe Sam was wrong. Tony, Tony, darling, wake up. That's the boy. Is it morning, Auntie Edna? No, dear, it's still night. We're going away, Tony. Away? Where, Auntie Edna? Well, I, I'm not sure, dear. I packed all your things. Listen, there's the doorbell. Who's there? Oh, I'll go and see. Get dressed, darling. I'll be right back. Evening, Mrs. Gladney. Oh, yes, officer? Mrs. Gladney, I got a couple of Christmas presents for you. These two kids. I'm very sorry, officer. The home is closed. The holidays, you know. Well, I'm afraid you got a stretcher point for these two. Oh, this little girl, she looks sick. I think she is. Why, she's got a fever. She's burning. Dr. Bresser. Bring them in, officer, quickly. Tony, darling, are you ready? Is it time to go? It's time to go, sweetheart. Get up. Up, lady. Where are we going, Auntie Edna? Not far. And Auntie Edna's decided that you're such a... such a big boy now that you can go alone. Oh, no, Auntie Edna. Now, listen, dear, listen. I have a wonderful Christmas surprise for you. You remember the... the nice man who can play football and has seven puppy dogs? And the real sailboat? Yes. And he's very sad because he has a lovely wife who wants a little boy very, very badly. And they haven't got one. So they want you to go and stay with them. And you'll be their little boy, darling. Isn't that lovely? They love you always. And, and you'll have a daddy, too. Like other little boys. You'll be very happy, darling. But then I can come back to you, can't I? Well, well, no, I, I don't think so, darling. You see, I'm, I'm just your Auntie Edna. And I'm lots of other children's Auntie Edna, too. But this lovely lady will be your... your own mummy. Come in. Mrs. Gladney? Yes, he's ready now. This is my wife, Mrs. Eldridge. May I... may I see him now? Tony, dear, this is your new mummy. Hello, mummy. And oh, my son. And oh, my baby. Will you take him, please? Right now. Come along, Tony. Thank you, Mrs. Gladney. You'll never know what this means to us. Goodbye. Oh, Tony. Oh, my darling. Don't leave Auntie Edna. Go away, Auntie Edna. Auntie Edna. Auntie Edna. Auntie Edna. Auntie Edna. Auntie Edna. So that thousands of other babies might have their chance we love. Sam. Sam. Max. Max, are you there? Yes, Edna. If you want me for anything, Max, I'll be here. Always. Mel brings our stars back to the microphone in just a moment for their curtain call. Now, here's our fashion reporter, Libby Collins. Well, what's new tonight, Libby? Well, Mr. Ruick, it says here in my fashion notebook, automobile tires rations. Well, that's an odd kind of fashion note, Libby. Not so odd when you remember that what it really means is that rubber is precious nowadays. 
Think of all the things women wear that have rubber or elasticized threads in them. Lots of sweaters and little jackets, midsections of dresses, and most important of all, girdles and foundation garments. We're going to have to learn to conserve these things to make them last longer. That means, of course, giving them the right kind of care. And that means, of course, new Quick Lux. It's ideal for elastic fibers because it's so gentle, has no harmful alkali to dry them out and make them lose their elasticity. And then with Lux, there isn't any of that cake soap rubbing that's so hard on them either. Be sure to Lux girdles often, not only for daintiness sake, but because they last longer if they're kept fresh and clean, if perspiration is luxed away promptly. With frequent luxing, you'll find that girdles will keep their fit better, stay new-looking longer. The Lux way is easy, quick, thrifty, and it's care advised by experts, people who make foundation garments and girdles, and smart stores that sell them advise Lux Flakes. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. To the two stars who brought us blossoms in the dust, we toss our finest bouquet for acting. And now, Greer Garson and Walter Pigeon take a curtain call they richly deserve. Thank you, Mr. Deneuve. It's been a real pleasure to be here in the Lux Radio Theater for the first time. And it'll still be fun the tenth time, Greer. <laughs> I have a thrill for both of you and a telegram just received. It reads, I am honored to have blossoms in the dust featured in the Lux Radio Theater with Miss Garson and Mr. Pigeon in the roles they originated. Being a constant listener to your program, I appreciate the value of once again presenting the message of this picture to the public. The wire is from Fort Worth, and it's signed by the superintendent of the Texas Children's Home and Aid Society. Her name, Mrs. Edna Gladney, the living heroine of our play. And we have a right to be proud that she's also a regular member of our audience. It was a great privilege to play the part in Mrs. Gladney tonight, Mr. Deneuve. But above all, it was a great challenge because of the kind of woman she is and the kind of work she's doing. And I'm sure everyone in the audience joins all of us in wishing her every success in that work. And a woman like Mrs. Gladney will never fail, Walter. What is your play for next week, Mr. Deneuve? Next week, we have an appointment with the new Universal Picture Success, Appointment for Love. And our stars will be Charles Boyer and Myrna Loy. It's a gay comedy about a playwright who marries a woman doctor. The doctor thinks love is strictly scientific. So the road to romance appears slightly rocky. But I think you'll like the way Myrna Loy and Charles Boyer work out the problem next Monday night. That sounds like a full house for the Lux Radio Theater, CB. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. We're scouting for another play for you, two. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Myrna Loy and Charles Boyer in Appointment for Love. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> except for the roles of Edna and Sam Gladney, and except for the Texas Children's Home and Aid Society, all events, characters, and institutions depicted in this play are fictitious. Any similarity to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual events and institutions is purely coincidental. The picture, Blossoms in the Dust, was directed by Mervyn Leroy. Throughout the United States, this week is being observed as Brotherhood Week under the sponsorship of the National Conference of Christians and Jews. Its purpose is to increase goodwill and cooperation among Americans of every religion and race. Heard in tonight's play were B. Benaderet as Charlotte, Marga Ann Dayton as Mrs. Cayley, Griff Barnett as Mr. Eldridge, Bobby Larson as Tony, Bernard Felton as Mrs. Gilworth, Eileen Pringle as Mrs. Keith, Tommy Cook as Sammy, and Ann Tobin, Leo Cleary, Buck Woods, Lillian Randolph, Jacqueline DeWitt, John Roche, Doris Cedarholm, Warren Ash, Jean O'Donnell, Ferdinand Munier, Mary Lou Harrington, and Charles Seal. Tune in next Monday night to hear Charles Boyer and Myrna Loy in Appointment for Love. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>